And yes, we are going. Hello, awesome. everyone. J J uh, Jake, you want to take this? Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, welcome um, to our second uh, live stream. So uh, today is kind of a new topic, our return to a topic that we did a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago on privacy. And um, Justin's going to be um, giving us a little bit of an update, some overviews. Um, he's going to be chat talking. I'm going to try to look at the chat and bring in questions. So just type them in there as as they pop into your head. Um, uh, and then we'll just make this kind of an organic conversation. Um, and if for those of you who it's your first time and you're wondering, OK, so who's what's Blockchains Minnesota? Um, basically, we are a group where, you know, uh, it's for people that are crypto blockchain enthusiasts and you like the technology, maybe you've invested some of it and it's a hobby, maybe it's a career for some of you. And it's, it's a friendly group of people that like to learn from one another, meet each other, network, things like that. Um, one thing that we're going to be coming out with soon that I mentioned in email a couple of days ago is we're going to try to do a business directory so that everybody can sort of um, put down what you're involved with, what kind of business you have outside of blockchain. So whether it's real estate or whatever tax or tax doing somebody's taxes, what, you know, whatever your expertise may be, it may be a great way to kind of inner network and get other people involved. So that's something that I'd like to get together, put together in the next couple of weeks. Um, so if you have a couple minutes at some point after we're done, shoot me, contact me on Telegram, and I'll start putting that stuff together. Um, all right, with that, I want to hand it over to the man of the hour, Justin. All right, take it away, man. All right, thanks, Jake. So to give a little bit of perspective, Jake had uh, a great meeting in early summer, if I remember correctly, about the general privacy technologies that were available. It was a pretty informal conversation. It was in a bar. We just had a great chance to sit and talk. Yeah. I wasn't even 21 yet, so I, I mostly just sat and talked. I wasn't even drinking there. Um, Are you 21 yet? Now I am. So we could. Uh, How does that feel? How does we that feel? Do that event. Okay, <laughs> but, we'll um, redo it. We'll redo it. <laughs> exactly. So uh, this is definitely an opportunity for everyone to ask questions. This is for both the Minnesota, the Twin Cities community in order to ask questions and also for everyone else that's interested. I am here today to talk about the ways that I uh, go through a process of evaluating uh, cryptocurrency private technologies and implementations because I know it's, it's very difficult overall to be able to look at some of the claims that people are making and actually figure out what this really means to me. What does it mean for my privacy? Um, even beyond what it would just mean for someone's investment, because you can kind of detach investment sort of in its own world where it, uh, it has some con connections to what the actual technology is like. Um, but even in those situations, you want to know if, if what you're investing in is has genuine fundamentals or not, especially if you're doing a, a relatively long-term play there, at least in any capacity. So uh, privacy is really important. I'm gonna spend most of my time today talking about why privacy is important and then what you can do about it, how you can look at existing projects and different technologies to figure out how effective they actually are, what they really mean for people. And then finally, what these projects contribute to the space and what value could be there for people who really care about privacy and fungibility in their cryptocurrency based system. So we have the YouTube chat here. Make sure you ask questions. Jake's going to be holding me accountable to make sure that we're answer answering all these questions that you have. So please make the use of it and we're happy to have you all on. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you all. All right, so you should all be seeing my slideshow now. I'm gonna wait like a second to make sure it shows up on YouTube here. 
But yes, today we're talking about evaluating private technologies and implementations for cryptocurrencies. And I have a few different projects or technologies in the bottom there. We'll be speaking about the majority of them today um, and talking about what makes a, a cryptocurrency meet some of these requirements. But first, who am I? Uh, if, you, if you met me before at one of the Blockchains Minnesota meetups, great. But uh, I'm, I'm Justin. I'm an organizer of the Monero Community Workgroup and the Monero Malware Response Workgroup. So I'm generally very involved in the Monero ecosystem, especially. I've been wearing a Monero Research Lab shirt personally, which I'm sure you can see once we cut back to individual faces and the slide goes away. I'm also a board member, though, of Magic, which is a nonprofit registered in Colorado that raises money for educational grants in cryptocurrencies. So if people want to do research, education or education focused items in cryptocurrencies make sure to check us out there we're in order to make the space better for everyone uh, i have previous experience in cybersecurity. i'm really interested in distributed privacy systems my interest in privacy system you mind muting your microphone so it doesn't focus on you that's okay oh, sorry my bad i apologize <laughs> Um, yeah, it should be in the bottom center there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, interested in distributed privacy systems. And I'm also involved in other, other uh, cryptocurrency ecosystems outside of Monero and other privacy projects. Even I am a senior moderator of the cryptocurrency subreddit, which has over 750,000 subscribers. And I have a student group at the university of Minnesota, which meets twice a week to talk about cryptocurrency related education. So we're really dedicated to providing education for people about all cryptocurrency topics. But personally, I find privacy a very interesting challenge that is really worth talking about here. So without further ado, it's important can, to- Can I interrupt you and ask you a quick question? Absolutely. Oh, um, okay, so you said you are interested in distributed privacy. Is there distributed privacy outside of blockchain, or is that just the only application of distributed privacy? Absolutely. So there are many different applications um, outside of, yeah, there's a ton of different applications outside of just cryptocurrencies. In fact, we've had distributed privacy systems before we've had cryptocurrencies. Networks like Tor, I2P, Freenet, these are all privacy focused networks that sure. allow people sure. to share data and you did not need a blockchain for that. So th that's really what got me involved in the, the privacy aspect of, of cryptocurrencies relatively early around 2014, 2015, is that I, I noticed that there was a strong opportunity there for people to take advantage of this distributed system, the, the blockchain based system, and get as many privacy advantages as you can out of it, because naturally in the past, we had already tried to build distributed systems that are built around privacy, that, that really prioritize privacy in this sort of implementation. So from my perspective, I thought that blockchain was simply a new way to pursue privacy and decentralized systems. They definitely existed before blockchain. Blockchain is just the latest development of these privacy distributed systems. So going back to my slides here. So most people think that privacy is binary, that it's a situation where you either have privacy or you don't. And unfortunately, it's just not this clear cut. Sure, it might be that for a cryptocurrency, you have an on or off feature for privacy, uh, such as using a private wallet or a transparent wallet or using a mixing service or not using a mixing service. But in reality, privacy isn't this simple. Instead, it's, it's, it's far more complex. And okay, perfect. So it really is the spectrum where on one side you have perfect privacy and on the other side you have perfect transparency. And we never get to either extreme. In order for something to be perfectly transparent, it also needs to be perfectly accessible. If you're on the moon, for instance, are you going to be able to access information? It's not completely transparent if you don't have a good internet connection 
Similarly, if, if you're in a desert and don't have internet connection, even on Earth, uh, that, or then you might, it, it's not perfectly transparent because it's not literally available everywhere at the same time. So Bitcoin gets close. It, it's able to be downloaded with anyone with an internet connection, but it's not perfectly transparent either, but it, it's pretty close. Similarly, with perfect privacy, we can never get there either. Even if you built a theoretically perfect private system where literally no information was leaked in any capacity, you still have the issue where users lose their private keys or lose access to their funds in some way. And then you can learn information such as what their balance is or who they're transacting with in general. So we, we can keep building systems that get closer and closer to the perfect privacy, but we'll never really get there. We'll, our privacy will be considered perfect. So just think of privacy as this, this ugly sort of spectrum where nothing's on either extreme. This is a quote from Ricardo Fluffy Pony Spagni, who's a Monero core team member. I generally ha uh, strongly agree with the statement. It says that privacy is not a thing that you achieve. It's a constant cat and mouse battle. So this really speaks to the fact that privacy, just like security, isn't something that you just check a box for and walk away from it and, and call yourself done. If you implemented uh, 1990s grade security in your application today, even if it was like the best, uh, like, like even if it followed the best standards for the 90s in, in terms of security for your network, it's likely going to be very vulnerable to modern attacks. So with privacy, we have to continuously fight against the better heuristics, the better analysis that people can do on data in order to keep systems private. So it's never something that we're just going to implement and be done with. Attackers are going to can constantly get better and better at analyzing this data. People originally thought Bitcoin was private enough, and then companies came along that actually looked at this transparent data and were able to make something out of it. So that just speaks to attackers or surveillance companies or whoever it might be, be better at making sense of this information. And as a result, we need to continuously adapt privacy systems to make them better. So what realistically can we do to make sure that, that the, or how do we assess privacy if it's the sort of ugly spectrum? Well, it all really comes back to the threat model. This is what do you need privacy for? If you only need privacy to hide that you are purchasing your significant other a Christmas present and when Christmas rolls around, then it's fine if they know what you're doing, then you don't really have a, a really strict threat model. Your threat model simply says, I want to keep the purchase for my significant other private until they receive it. You don't necessarily need uh, something that is incredibly resilient against all attack and, and nation level like attack. But if it's for the second significant other, then, then it better be a very high threat level. I'm just kidding. Yeah, so that would be a potentially, depending on who you, who you ask, that would be an immoral or perfectly fine circumstance. But in any case, that might be something that uh, you would have a stricter threat model for where you don't want a motivated person or a motivated single investigator or whatever it might be to learn about you. Um, but some people have threat models as strict as nation states where they might be living in a country that doesn't allow free speech. They might be living in a country like Iran. They might, uh, that might surveil a lot of their information. So they need much stronger protections in those cases. So it's important to compare what actual advantages of privacy that are offered in these, these uh, technology systems and these cryptocurrency implementations to the actual threat models that they protect against. It allows us to get away from claims about privacy and it allows us to really connect these claims of privacy compared to how they actually provide protection in the real world. Now we're back to something that we can more easily understand. And from this, you can sort of determine that Bitcoin is not very private for most circumstances. It is true that when you're operating in Bitcoin system, 
that you are pseudo anonymous. You don't have your social security number recorded on the blockchain, or at least I hope you don't, right? Uh, it would be very wrong if you somehow accidentally put it in there. But instead, you just have a, a string of numbers and letters that represent your account. And there are very transparent connections based off how this string associates with others. So if you have this account, you go to an exchange, you make a purchase, and then you purchase something at a coffee shop or you just give your friend money for whatever purpose, there are transparent, really clear, unambiguous connections between people. So in this diagram here, this is, this is a service by Elliptic, which is a, data, a blockchain uh, data analysis company. You can see that they have connections between the flow of funds uh, among certain exchanges here, for instance, or, or other large services in the Bitcoin ecosystem where you can track how funds are being sent in this ecosystem. So whenever you're making a transaction in this completely transparent system, you are essentially putting yourself at risk. Whoever you associate learns everything about the past history of funds. They know the amount, they know everything that's gonna happen in the future. So there are some things you can do to protect your privacy, but ultimately you're fighting an uphill battle here. You need to, it's really hard to conceal something that is totally in public for everyone to see. And this transparency has real implications on people and businesses. If you reveal what the source of all the funds are, they get to see for an individual who you're working for, for instance. Say, like, uh, you're working for Coinbase. Everyone knows that Coinbase gets money that's deposited on Coinbase. They have their own internal settlement system where they keep track of how funds are handled. But there's likely going to be some sort of connection to the funds you receive. People can say, hey, this person's working for this company. And that might be especially damaging if you are working for an activist sort of company that might have some sort of, uh, even whether it's a political agenda or even social agenda, uh, it could be, it could give people a lot of reason to uh, learn a lot of information about you. They also learn all of your family and friend connections. So if you receive money from your family and then pay someone money in some, in some capacity, well, then they likely know who your family members are. They can just look at, okay, what transactions did this person make around Christmas? And they can clearly sort of figure those things out. Uh, for businesses, they, uh, outside people get to learn who all the business suppliers are and all upstream business connections. So if I'm a competitor and I know who your business suppliers are, and I know uh, it, it can really put you at a strong disadvantage. It can put me at a really strong advantage in terms of competing with this competitor. I, if I know everything about their business, it makes things really hard for them. And then something regarding fungibility, which I'll really talk about towards the end, but that's really important in making sure that you don't need to worry about where the source of funds is coming from if you're just doing a completely legitimate transaction. Similarly, for expenses, you don't necessarily want everyone to know what your political and religious affiliations are. That might be overstepping the bounds for some people. It might be dangerous for people, potentially LGBTQ youth or adults that are living in states where they could be fired for, for their certain sexual orientations or whatever it might be. Similarly, if you go to a health specialist and have to make them uh, make a payment to them, people are going to like, it's pretty obvious that you needed to go to the health specialist. And that reveals a lot of health data that most people don't feel comfortable with. Similarly, for businesses too, you, you learn all the customers and downstream business connections. You can learn people's everyday purchasing habits. This is the equivalent of you making your credit card payment history transparent for every month. That's something most people don't feel comfortable with. And for businesses, it reveals at all their all their employees. That's a ton of information. That's a lot of in information that's typically not made public for people. And then wouldn't you agree that right now, kind of with credit cards uh, and paying all the time, basically all that inf a lot of that information on individuals is basically available to companies? Yeah. So this takes it a step further. You are totally correct that if if you made payments on a credit card that you are generally revealing information to the credit card provider 
often you are giving them the permission to collect data on what your expenses are and sell this data to third parties. However, this isn't necessarily available to the entire world. It's not such the case that I'm a business owner, I make a transaction and they know exactly what my account balance is and everything that I've done with it. They likely do not have access to this information. Uh, so this is, this is even worse than using a credit card for most people, um, frankly. And then in regard to balances, this really exacerbates uh, the first two problems with people knowing the sources and expenses. They know how much money people have. This gives attackers the ability to target crime against wealthy individuals, wealthy companies, um, especially in the cases of malware and robbery. So if you know a company is sitting on a war chest and you know exactly how much money they have, you're going to easily figure out who to prioritize at hacking, right? Um, and if, if, if you do in fact infiltrate the systems, you have a much better idea how much money you should ask for because you know how much money they have on hand. It, it make, gives attackers a strong advantage there. Uh, similarly, uh, it lets competitors know how much you're willing to pay suppliers and charge your customers. If like they can easily undermine your business if you can't have a competitive advantage anymore, if you make every aspect of your business transparent, that's pretty difficult. And then similarly, they know how much you pay your employees as a business. So a competitor could come and poach these employees much, uh, much simpler than if they did not have access to this information. So transparency has a big implications for people and businesses, even under completely legitimate circumstances. You can argue that there are advantages for illegitimate circumstances too, or illicit or illegal circumstances, but there are so many advantages we take for granted with the private system uh, that we might be losing if we move to a completely transparent system uh, that I really like to remind people to keep in mind. Again, if you have any questions, make sure to ask them and we'll, we'll be sure to answer some of those. So what can really be done? We have these existing large transparent solutions. We have Bitcoin and Ethereum. There is an argument to be made that you can just add a privacy system on top of these, on top of these already transparent systems that people can use if they want to, but to be really short, it, it's hard to say how effective these solutions actually are. So for the sake of this conversation here, this introductory conversation, let's assume that all the transactions you make within this orange box here, this orange private system, whether it's a mixer, Tumblr, ZK Snark, ZK Stark, whatever it might be, let's say that they are effective for, for the sake of this presentation. That's this a transaction where both components happen within this system, this, this little green arrow here. However, generally speaking, this, this private portion is not the majority of the network. It's something people generally need to opt in and pay extra funds to do. So it's generally not widely used. So you're talking here about how in Zcash, and correct me if I'm wrong, Zcash is one of the big uh, cryptocurrencies. And so with them, you can choose to be on the private network, or if not, then it's on the public network. Is that accurate? Is that what you're sort of talking about? Yes. ZK, Z, uh, Zcash is a great example of this, where they have two different systems. They have the big black outline box there that's their whole, like all of Zcash. And then they have their orange box there, which is the shielded pool, the, the private pool, so to speak. So only a small portion of their, their network is kept in this shielded pool. And you can see the same thing for pretty much any other technology, whether it's a Bitcoin mixer or it's a special Bitcoin wallet that has some privacy feature. Generally, these are not widely used. And as a result, you have a very small anonymity set. You have very few people that actually use this sort of system. And as a result, it's very unlikely that you're actually going to make a transaction completely within this system in the could be effective sort of category there. Generally, so what me, I, Oh, sorry, go ahead. No. Um, I was gonna ask, how about you finish this and I'll, I'll ask my question, I apologize. Okay, yeah, no worries. So generally what happens, if, if, if you send a transaction between the transparent portion and the private system, this orange arrow here, it's really hard to say if you actually get a good amount of privacy. 
It's likely you get more privacy than using a completely transparent system, but it's complicated. There's an enormous laundry list of conditions because you're leaking a lot of metadata in these circumstances. It's really hard to say. And of course, if you're sending this red arrow transaction over here, it's completely transparent. And as a result, you obviously do not have a high degree of privacy. So I, I just included this on the slide here to say that it's really difficult to add a tool to a transparent system and call it good because generally people do not know how to use it properly. It's not well supported on the network. And if it was well supported on, on the network, then you could just make it mandatory anyway. So in general, these, these pri the actual effectiveness of adding a privacy solution on top of a transparent system is generally really small and comes with a huge set of conditions. All right, Jake, what question? Do you yeah. Have? yeah, sorry for interrupting you earlier. Um, so I read recently that there was a development that they were able to shrink the size, I believe, of the transactions for the privacy transactions. So I and I don't know if it was Zcash or Monero, but this is sort of a kind of a philosophical question where eventually if if the price for a private transaction drops to a low enough threshold, then there's almost you know, no disincentive, there's no reason not to use it, right? So eventually, my, and this is the question, don't you think that it will become private? Like in a Zcash case where they're just going to say, you know, we don't need to have a public ledger because sending it privately is very efficient anyway? Yeah, there's definitely an argument to be made there. Uh, you're speaking really at, uh, to two different updates. Monero and Zcash each had enormous updates last month that substantially reduced the, the difficulty in sending private transactions generally. For Monero, the transactions got a lot smaller and a lot cheaper. It now costs about half a cent to send them a normal Monero transaction, regardless of the amount. And for Zcash, they substantially reduced the amount of time needed to actually send transactions in addition to a ton of other updates that came with it that really helped with usability. So you're absolutely correct that in building these private systems, we want them to be as simple to use. We want them to I mean, really be cheaper and more convenient than using, than using transparent systems. The reality is though, that really with any of these privacy systems, uh, it's, it's generally be easier to make an efficient, transparent system. So it doesn't necessarily, like, it, it might be the case today that Bitcoin's transaction fees are greater than Monero's transaction fees, but it doesn't mean that Monero necessarily is always going to be more efficient than Bitcoin. Monero transactions are still larger. They're still generally more cumbersome and Bitcoin has more opportunities for it to become more efficient. Transparent systems generally are more efficient than private systems. So it's a sort of battle where we need to get private systems efficient enough where realistically no one cares. If, if there's like a small, if, if, if the fee drops from a 10th of a cent to nine, a hundredth of a cent or whatever it might be, then maybe no one will care and they'll prefer the privacy. But it's generally something that efficient transparent systems will generally be more efficient than their private counterparts. But a lot of research is going to narrow this gap as much as possible. Does that make sense? Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on then, um, a lot of people ask questions about mixing. I'm only gonna spend a few minutes here because it's a relatively primitive method in terms of providing privacy. But this is some solution you can put on top of any system. Many cryptocurrencies facilitate this process. But what essentially happens is several people take their funds, they send them to a centralized service, a mixer. This is some server somewhere that mixes up whose funds are whose and in a single transaction sends all the funds to everyone. So it makes it ambiguous whose sources of funds ended up where but there are generally a lot of downfalls to this approach. So first is that the only people paying money and opting into the slow service are people that really need to mix their funds. 
you're not going to mix brand new Coinbase outputs. By Coinbase outputs, I mean new mining rewards because there's no previous history that you need to wash or clean. So people aren't going to pay for a service they don't need. And that, that has a lot of negative implications. Also, you are trusting the server to provide entropy for you. They might act nefariously. They might collect information about you. They might collude with other entities to provide some information. So in general, it, it's not good to have to trust a participant to actually provide the privacy. And then finally, it just takes a while. It, it's generally pretty slow, especially if you're mixing large amounts. And overall, it just isn't really effective for a lot of these reasons combined. There are so many attack vectors built out to this system now especially if you can trace transaction amounts, even if you have it set up so that you're, they're broken into de denominations, that I would not really recommend this for anyone. This was maybe the state of art, the state of the art solution in 2013, but we've moved on from here. And this is, we have much better solutions in place where you have a lot more entropy without having a slow trusted entity in between. And the effectiveness of optional privacy in extre even extremely private systems is complicated. For the sake of this presentation, let's just say that Zcash fully shielded transactions are awesome. They're essentially perfect. Um, and so it's great. But the problem is very few people actually use this feature. So researchers from the University of College London and several other universities prepared this uh, pie chart on the left, which I've simplified for you on the right here. So the green portion are funds that are completely transparent. They are literally identical to Bitcoin. They're exactly identical. Now this pink portion here are funds that are partially shielded. And as a result, it's iffy or it's complicated to determine what actual level of privacy is offered here. It's likely better than the green portion. It's not likely worse, but it's hard to say if this actually provides a lot of privacy there only this little tiny blue fraction here at the top, which is about half a percent of all transactions on Zcash, use this fully shielded feature and what we'll call for the sake of this conversation, a, a high, to have a high degree of privacy. Luckily, they've provided advantage, uh, several updates, the, the one I, I spoke about last month that makes it easier to use. We haven't really seen a large increase yet for the two and a half weeks it's been out. But recently, a few days ago, uh, some, well, uh, some uh, mining pools added support for it. So hopefully this is the beginning of a trend where people will use it more and more. But I'm just trying to emphasize here that even if you add a system that is theoretically really, really good to a transparent system, it doesn't mean it actually functions pretty well. Um, so just keep that in mind there, there's that, that's a different component here. You can't just look at the theoretical best implementation of something and assume that is actually how it's implemented. There's so let me, let me ask you a quick question here. Um, cause it sort of begs, begs the question, um, though, doesn't it, so obviously, um, Zcash is doing some sort of R and D obviously Monero is doing R and D. It, it almost feels like the people that actually care very much about privacy, um, they would know that Zcash has these issues and they've probably already moved over to Monero, right? I mean, it, it, that seems like the logical uh, effect, right? It's really hard to say. So okay. um, I, I would hope that people would know how to make the best of their system, but generally privacy is very hard and people typically don't know how to really use the system for their, their full uh, benefit. I can speak in a few slides about how Monero and Zcash have some limitations and how we have people try and address these limitations, but ultimately we're still in a state where we have some idea, but we don't have a really great user facing tools on how to accomplish this. And even if people are aware of the limitations, it doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to address them properly, or they know what the magnitude of these problems are. It's what an is, enormous mess. 
What is the um, volume of transactions for Zcash versus Monero? Like how big are the two user groups? So in general, Zcash has more total transactions than Monero transactions. Um, I would have to look up the exact amounts recently, um, but there are only about a, if, if I remember correctly, about a dozen to three dozen private transactions on Zcash a day. Um, oh, with, wow. with Monero, there's a, several thousand a day. Again, fewer total transactions in Zcash, but with Zcash, the majority of them are transparent. Um, yeah. Again, yeah. I hope that they that the shielded proportion has increased slightly after sapling and we've seen more support even in the past few weeks. So I'm optimistic that it will increase, but they have a large uphill battle here. Um, so we have a few questions on just uh, some other implementations of, of CryptoNote, such as Rio and BitTube. I'm not gonna talk about those yet, but uh, if we have time left, we can speak about some of the different privacy projects that have come up and how you can affect, evaluate these smaller projects. So, um, so what does that mean? Does that mean that you just make a privacy system mandatory? Well, not necessarily, because if you make a terrible privacy sol solution mandatory, you still have a terrible privacy solution. You need to make a good privacy, sol uh, privacy solution mandatory. So to this end, um, again, not trying to claim Monero is just a terrible implementation, but they have made uh, privacy improvements to their system because it isn't perfect. You can't just say, since you have a mandatory private system that you're done, you have to keep iterating from there. So for example, Monero has increased its ring size from three eventually to 11 like we have now. Uh, the ring size is, is an example of potential metadata. So we made it mandatory so you cannot send unusual ring size transactions because what happened was people would increase the ring size and they would use the same ring size for multiple transactions. They'd be like, hey, that's the dude that sends a transaction with the ring size of 71. That's a piece of metadata that can be used to attack users. There are also other improvements like better remote node metadata protection, a tool where you could uh, better assess the state of the network and um, avoid really adversarial situations so they occur with a black ball tool. This has recently been renamed to a spent outputs tool just to make it a little bit clearer. And then also things where you can send funds to yourself to get additional entropy. Again, some of these things are still in relatively early stages of being understood, but we luckily understand it a lot better than we did in 2014. But just know that the, the point I want to make here is that even ju just because you make something mandatory doesn't mean it's good either. You can make mixing mandatory on Bitcoin and it doesn't mean it would be effective. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult sort of trade-offs you need to make here. And similarly, just because you have something called a zero knowledge proof does not mean it's perfect either. So Monero uses zero knowledge proofs for its uh, technology but its ring signatures are not perfect. They don't include the whole entropy set. So you need to compensate in some ways if you have really strict threat models. And also things like payment IDs in Monero are messy. They're an additional point of metadata that could potentially be used to learn more information. Um, what, what was the whole entropy set? I, I'm not familiar with that. So what I'm referring to is uh, when you send a Monero transaction, you refer to a limited number of previous outputs as being possibly spent in the transaction. I have a few slides how these exactly work, but it's not every single possible source of funds. And as a result, uh, especially under situations where people before and after you have your funds are trying to collude, it could potentially be, be damaging to your privacy. So ring signatures are zero knowledge, but it doesn't mean that it's perfect and there are I, I've spent a lot of my time researching these ring signatures, and frankly, I could speak for hours on these alone. So we'll, we'll probably move on from these and uh, just say that they're not perfect and leave it there for today. Um, and even with Zcash, they have uh, a very private system generally in their fully shielded pool, but when they do upgrades, they make you send funds to the completely transparent system. And in the, something called a turnstile migration process, and 
there is a lot of leaked metadata in those circumstances. It's likely impossible to really do this in a way that provides a really strong degree of protection. So this is an example of how a specific implementation, um, a, a specific trade-off they had to make to try and help provide more auditability of Zcash means that they have less privacy. Uh, and the Zcash team has not yet explained to people how they really want this process to occur. They say you should do things in a good way, but haven't outlined a great way to actually do it yet. So this is a case where even informed users are generally in the dark for the best process to actually use these privacy systems. And similarly, they made a trade-off when they upgraded the sapling where they leaked more output metadata. Now they're trying to move this to, to fix this in a later release, but as it stands right now, uh, Zcash Sapling releases more metadata than Zcash Sprout. So, um, and Sapling's a new version, Sprout is the old version. So again, this is something that would be, it should be fixed in future versions, but is an example of even something that people generally regard to as perfect. Well, you can still sometimes see some information such as output metadata, perhaps fees in order to learn more about transactions than, than people might originally let on with, to begin with. And both reveal some output metadata and both have timing attacks such as when you send transactions and a lot of other considerations. The problem is you don't know what heuristics people will use to learn more information. And these heuristics will get better over time. So you need to do the best at outlining what these are, predicting them, and providing defenses against things that people aren't even using to attack your network yet. And we don't know what we don't know. So this is, a, this is a very difficult sort of problem, something that always needs continuous improvement upon, not something we're just going to claim we're ever done at any certain point in time. So I, like, I actually kind of like the slide. Um, this is a sort of privacy matrix that I put together just to get an idea of how the ecosystem generally is. So on the x-axis there, you have the theoretical maximum privacy. So if you took no compromises whatsoever, again, for better or worse, in implementing the solution, what is the sort of privacy that really can be offered through these mechanisms? And on the y-axis, I have the general accessibility and usability of these systems. So on the left there, you have Bitcoin and Dash as, an, as examples where they don't really offer a lot of theoretical maximum privacy out of the box, but generally they're highly accessible and highly usable. And as Monero and Zcash and other privacy focused cryptocurrencies become more accessible, these will likely improve as well. So it's likely that these less private solutions are more accessible and usable for people. Um, on the right, far right there, you have Zcash which has a high potential for theoretical maximum privacy, where you have a lot of entropy in your private set if, if you really take a lot of care in doing it properly. But in general, it's less accessible and less usable. Again, their sampling upgrade allowed it to sort of move up. So I have an example there with the arrow pointing up where their technological improvements are allowing it to become more accessible and usable. And for Monero, it's generally more accessible and usable uh, for the privacy feature than Zcash's privacy feature, but it offers generally less theoretical maximum privacy, even though improvements are pushing it up into the upper right. So ideally, if you're building privacy systems, you want it to be in the upper right there. It's just that we don't have a solution currently that checks every single box that is really in the upper right-hand corner there for how great it is. Now, I also have one currency here. It's called Grin. It's sort of a little bit transparent there because it hasn't released yet. But this is a solution that offers a lot of uh, efficiency with a few compromises to privacy. So when it launches, it will sort of fit that middle space there where, again, depending on your threat models, it might be good enough at addressing your threat models and provide more efficiency if, if that's your priority. So really it depends what your situation is, but I like this general chart because it helps show you that in order for privacy to be used, it needs to be able to be used and it needs to provide a lot of privacy out of the box. So you can almost think about it as like on the Y axis, how often is the privacy system used? If it's mandatory, that's good. 
And then on the x-axis, how effective is this actual implementation? So this helps put it together in a nice simple chart for people. Okay, so some privacy solutions to really consider depending on your application. Uh, the first is Monero that I wanna talk about. Again, not saying that these are in any particular order here, um, but Monero uses a ring signature sort of scheme where several masked people that you don't know the identity of appear to sign a transaction. You don't know who actually signs it. And this is combined of ring signatures, ring CT, and stealth addresses to provide a sort of layered privacy approach there. Then you have Zcash, which has a transparent pool and a private pool, like we mentioned earlier. This uses a technology called ZK Snarks, which provides many advantages when you're dealing completely within the private pool because you have much more entropy than a, a few people sitting at a table, maybe a dozen people sitting at a table, signing a transaction like in Monero. In this case, you would have the entire entropy set, the whole shielded set appear to be possible senders. So that's, that's an improvement there in that regard. If you are building a more database focused privacy solution, you can look at something like Enigma. They are currently building a solution on top of Ethereum, but with, are eventually going to move to their own system, hopefully. And this provides a mechanism where users can privately give access to their, to their files, which are actually stored on a centralized server, but the record is indexed on the, on the blockchain itself. So again, this is much, the, the intent of this is to be more versatile than Monero and Zcash, which are transaction focused. Enigma is more database focused. And it's one of the largest projects in this realm, although there still are a few other competitors too that are, are sort of getting started. And then in the future, you have a company called Starkware, which is monetizing a technology called ZK Starks. It's not Snarks, but they're similar in many ways. They provide many privacy adva advantages just like Snarks do, but they come at efficiency hits. So they're not as efficient as ZK Snarks. ZK Snarks are really, really efficient in Zcash generally. Um, but the benefit there is that you don't have a trusted setup as far as the implementation is concerned. So even if the system was compromised, you would not have a mechanism for people to print funds out of air or potentially impact the privacy of the setup uh, with Zcash there's an ability for people to print funds, which is why they have this whole turnstile migration process. And some people allege that it also could impact the privacy there too, although um, that's sort of an unknown sort of situation. So, so are you are you referring, there's this, um, like if I, correct me if I'm wrong, there's this whole mythology about how Zcash started and you know, and how you have to trust those original founders or something like that, right? Am I on the right track? Yes, that's and exactly then, what I'm talking about. They and, have and, been, then, and you're saying Stark where they somehow fixed that mythological founding problem. Yes, yeah, so it, it provides similar, or it provides very similar privacy advantages without requiring this initial setup by these individuals or group of individuals. Uh, however, it currently comes at a cost to efficiency that is impractical for normal use. But it's something right. that absolutely is really interesting to keep an eye on, especially in the next five or so years, as these become more efficient and as technology improves. This is sort of the wish list for the future going forward. Yeah, just for people that haven't, you know, we're, don't follow this, and I'm obviously not really... Uh, um, an expert, but apparent if I, you know, on a simple level, when Zcash was founded, somehow there were um, like a small group of people that you have to basically trust that they have not compromised the security of the system. It all boils down to them. So if you trust them, then everything is trustworthy, I guess. Is So a lot of people don't trust Zcash because of that kind of first sin, I guess you could call it, of Zcash. Absolutely. This depends on what you feel comfortable trusting. If you feel comfortable with this set up a trusted system as they did it, then you can feel free to take advantage of the privacy advantages of this more efficient system. If you don't feel comfortable, then you have to look at other less trusted options in general. So moving on. 
I want to give a quick note about comparison charts before going forward. It is common for small projects to sort of put out these comparison charts in terms of claiming why their project is better in, in, in some way or another. And generally, they're highly dramatized, cherry-picked data, and don't necessarily make too much sense. Uh, for example, ASICs resistance. Like, what does this even mean? Like, you have check marks here, but what does this even mean? Monero had ASICs developed for it in the past. Zcash has ASICs developed for it. Uh, a lot of these other al algorithms have ASICs. This is an example where people just sort of put miscellaneous data on here that doesn't necessarily make too much sense. Um, so be one way to not look at evaluating projects are to just take PR pieces from whatever project you're evaluating. It might be good to like look at and see what they're trying to claim as an advantage, but generally they don't provide a great mechanism on what the eff actual effectiveness of privacy is. See, for example, here, this is, they, they claim to be the next generation privacy cryptocurrency. And again, I have no knowledge even of what Bulwark is. I'm not endorsing them in any way. But if you look on this chart, the only thing they have is this little thing that says untraceable slash, slash mixing, which doesn't even make any sense. It, it doesn't make sense. Dash uses a built-in mixer and they have an X, for example. So this really doesn't make any sense. There's no good indication on this chart that actually shows how effective something is. And so I would just say be very but, careful looking at PR. But, yeah, but Justin, their master nodes have made 200, over 200%. 200 That's a winner. Yeah, that, that generally is a clear indication that they are off base. If they are explaining <laughs> their privacy solution without talking about what it is and instead talking about how good their ROI is, you generally have a good indication to run far away. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really fun. I've never even heard of them. I that's have, cool. This is just a Google image search literally for these things. And I'm like, oh, I'll pull this and talk about how you should not pay attention to this. And you have almost every project does this. This example here on the left is a satirical example where you have things like trusted setup pitched as a good thing, right? Which, which is objectively a bad thing. Um, or even the bas last point where they're like, we don't want to give coins to greedy miners. Like that, that's an incredibly subjective thing that is just sort of pick the cherry pick data. Um, and on the right there, you have an instance where, again, you have things that don't make any sense. Sure, you have a bunch of technologies sort of listed on the left there, but you have no idea what their actual implementation of these technologies are. They could be implemented in an incredibly un like an incredibly ridiculous way that makes no sense. And you have no mechanism by just looking at this chart that they provided that they have any sort of sensible privacy at all. So don't look for a sort of feature set when you're necessarily just looking at these cryptocurrencies. It's much, much more involved than these things. Um, well, okay, so I'm seeing something and I mean, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not interrupting your flow too much. So. But this, this just strikes me as kind of interesting. So they have Tor there, Tor OBF. Uh, so somehow they're connecting to Tor. Is that a real thing? Is that like uh, on the horizon somehow this merging of Tor and privacy cryptos or like what, how, how does this even work? So Tor is really interesting. Um, and honestly, if you see a project that advertises Tor as their main privacy feature, you should immediately be suspicious. Reason being, right. <laughs> Tor, Tor is an important privacy technology. However, it is generally independent of your blockchain implementation. The blockchain doesn't care about Tor in any way. It's not a consensus requirement you add to blockchain. It's not like your system will look up to see if the transaction was sent through Tor before accepting it. That is not what happens. You can't really do that. Instead, it might speak to their wallet connecting through Tor by default or offering support for Tor, but frankly, everything offers support for Tor. Uh, for example, Bitcoin can be used with Tor. Monero, Zcash, Dash, Verge, they can all be used with Tor. So you need to be... Just because like, like this is something that people commonly refer to. And honestly, it's because most mainstream people who don't know a lot about these technologies 
hear Tor and think of privacy, but again, they don't know exactly how it works and what exact benefits are provided. So they just think about it, that they essentially overweight the importance of this thing. So Tor is important, but it's not nearly as important as the data that's stored on the blockchain forever for everyone to see. And there are absolutely ways for you to hide this network metadata. You can go to a coffee shop and then you don't need Tor. You could run it on, run this wallet on Cubes OS and then it uses Tor. So this is an example where a project generally advertises or markets something without, it's like specifically for a purpose, for a person who doesn't know how to evaluate the actual effectiveness of this, this privacy technology. So right. like, for example, if I'm making a, an in-person payment at a coffee shop, Tor doesn't help me, right? I hide my networking metadata, maybe, but they still learn what my address is. They still learn how much money I have and every connection I have. So Tor in that case provides essentially no protection. So it's important to sort of put these things in perspective and it's hard for someone who is trying to just research by looking at these charts to know what really makes sense and what, what doesn't. It, it really is far more nuanced than these, these sort of charts really convey. So I just included these as examples of bad charts um, just for the sake of allowing people to sort of look at things and realize like, hey, this is clearly biased and it doesn't actually tell me anything. <laughs> um, most people aren't going to understand what like stealth addresses and mandatory stealth addresses are, especially when they claim Monero doesn't have them when they've had them since inception. Basically, it's it's a big joke. Um, it was yeah. So a, the best way for you to really look at it, um, and apparently, I, yeah, need to click that button to get the Monero one to show up there. But you can, instead of looking at whatever technologies are available, you need you basically need someone to sort of prepare the, okay, what's the actual impact of these different technologies and how they're used? So on the left, I have Monero. In the middle, I have Zcash and Bitcoin kind of. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then on the right, I have Pivx. In my opinion, these are the three main projects that have at least some sensible things going on in terms of transaction privacy. So on the left, the source of funds for Monero has decent protection. These are the ring signatures. They have a high opportunity to work well. And for most people, they work well, but you just need to be careful if you have really strict threat models. So just keep in mind, these are not perfect, but the receiver and amount are well protected. And you can see there some efficiency things like the transaction size is, is larger than a Bitcoin transaction, but not terribly large. The verification time is small, but more than Bitcoin transactions. And the signing time is nice and small. For the middle, I have Zcash, uh, but this is broken up into two components. On the left, I have their completely transparent transactions, which are the same as Bitcoin. So on the left is transparent Bitcoin, uh, sorry, transparent Zcash and Bitcoin. And on the right, you have fully shielded Zcash. So on the left, they don't protect the source, receiver, or amount of funds, but the transaction size is really tiny. The verification time and signing time are really infinitesimal. They're tiny. It's great. For Zcash, they're pretty efficient. They're generally more efficient than Monero. They have the opportunity to provide a better protection for the source of funds, uh, but the downfall generally is that the signing time is, is larger. Um, this used to be uh, like tens of seconds. Now it's down to about two seconds. So that's that's a major improvement. And Pivx, I have some stars here because they're working on some benefits to improve these things. But in general, they use, uh, in my opinion, uh, an inferior sort of protocol. They protect the source of funds pretty well uh, if shielded. Again, they have a sort of dual type system. But the receiver is currently not protected in the system. They send it generally to a, a completely public address. The amount is not protected. It's broken up into denominations, which is something Monero used to do in its early history, but generally is not very effective at all. The transaction size is currently very large. There are plans to reduce it closer to Monero size, but it likely will always be the bulkiest of the three. I really don't know what the verification time is, so I left that as not sure. And the signing time is the longest of any of these uh, these cryptocurrencies. So 
these are sort of things to consider. It's generally, in my opinion, a better chart than before. There's several other things we can talk about, but it, it's important to sort of note here, you have a list of, uh, like a short list of some of their benefits and disadvantages here, even if it doesn't yeah, cover that's the nice. How are we, um, how many more slides do you have? I wanna make sure we get to questions. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna skip over some specifically work slides for the sake sure. of time. Um, so I'll skip over these. This just shows an example of the different technologies that come together to help Monero, uh, uses a ring signature function where it selects other outputs on the blockchain and it makes it seem as if, uh, as if they're all hidden and then it uses ring CT to hide the actual transaction amount. Oh my God, that looks like calculus. Okay, all yeah, right, just if, kidding. If, a little, if that was a, an optimistic, if we had extra time. Um, <laughs> so uh, the good thing is you don't know uh, for a, a fully uh, private by mandate system, whether money is actually spent or not, you don't actually know when. For Bitcoin, it's really clear. For Monero, you don't actually know if, since money shows up if it's actually spent or not. Um, again, skipping over this portion a little bit, but in general, in summary, you're able to make an ambiguous origin of funds, an unknown amount of Monero sent, and then uh, going to unknown actual addresses. So for the information on the blockchain, a lot of the stuff is obfuscated. Um, and the good thing is you sort of have the strength in numbers where outputs reference other transactions and they themselves are outputs or reference and others. And then there's an additional web of other transactions that, that get built on. So Monero's how privacy is provided by- you, Sorry, how many transactions do you need like on a daily basis to feel good about the amount of privacy you're getting? Uh, the best answer is just as much as possible. <laughs> um, no, it, it's, it depends on your threat model. I would say that it's good to have, like as many as possible is good for you. So if, okay, um, yeah, I would say the big thing is just making sure that ideally multiple people are sending transactions around the same time you are. So I would say ideally you wanna make sure there are other transactions in the same block as you. So the reason I asked is like, you know, in statistics, right? There's a kind of uh number that you want at least 32 samples in a statistical sample at least or else you can't really do you know a p test or whatever um so i was just curious if there was some magic number over which you're you're in the good zone or below it's definitely a no-go so no it's okay I, I don't expect there that there would be for sure yeah the, the biggest uh, I have, an ex I have uh, a little bit on this later, but the biggest concern with Monero is if the sender of a transaction colludes with uh, the later receiver of the transaction. So I send money to you and then you send money to the exchange. If I collude with the exchange, there might not be a ton of entropy in Monero's ring signatures to really help you out. So uh, there might be some additional privacy protections you might need to take if that's a major concern that you have. So. Sure. That's, that's the real limitation of Monero. Otherwise, uh, you're generally okay for things. Um, but in summary, I have this nice little questionnaire when you're evaluating projects. So first, look, how good is the theoretical best? If this implementation is implemented well, how well does it work? Also, perhaps even more importantly, how is it currently used? Do people actually use this system? Are they using it like a mixer where it's pretty obvious how you can trace some of the metadata or is there a, a nice variety of use so it's hard to figure things out? What metadata is leaked? Do you reveal the amount for every transaction? Do you reveal the outputs in a way that shouldn't uh, be revealed for transactions? What other possible attack vectors do you have? Is there a weak uh, network where there aren't many nodes relaying transactions? Is it generally robust? Uh, how secure is the network? Also, how realistic is it to use? If you have a privacy feature that requires you to have a supercomputer running for 50 minutes to send a single transaction, it's unlikely that many people are going to use it. And in order for you to really have a lot of entropy in the system, you need it to be easy to use or else only generally criminals are the ones that are using it, which doesn't really help the criminals because they're the only ones using it. Um, they don't hide them on anyone else. Um, 
And then is there any research explaining why this technology works and how good, how verbose and how effective is this? If you have a project that comes along and says, hey, whether it's Rio or BitTube or whatever else is mentioned in the chat and says, we're going to change these parameters. Why are you changing these parameters? What is the impact of you changing these parameters? Or if you have a project that invents a sort of new system, they say, hey, we've solved the world problem, all these problems. We're doing ZK snarks plus ZK snarks plus ring signatures plus ring CT and stealth addresses. Okay, how does this mechanism work? Why is it better? Are you sure that you haven't created a critical flaw where this is just going to be exploited in some way? So if, if they, it, it's fine for projects to have accessible resources to people who are not technical. But if they do not also have technical resources that can really walk the walk and really be evaluated by people, I literally don't even look at it. Um, reason being, they haven't gone through the time to really test this process. In order for you to really be testing the actual effectiveness of a privacy solution, you need, need, need to go through the whole research process so that people can actually see how effective it is. Otherwise, you're just taking their claims at face value. So if they don't have something available, that's a major, major red flag. And I'm not just talking about a, a PR white paper. I'm talking about like really in-depth explanation on how the system works and ideally also systems testing how effective these are, basically looking at possible attack vectors. Similarly, once people find limitations, because there are limitations for every system since nothing's perfect, are they open to discussing these? Do they talk about how users can potentially work around them? Or do they clearly communicate what the general limitations are? And are they acting in good or bad faith? Are they making useless, ridiculous comparison charts for the sake of marketing and trying to pump price and claim how good their ROI is? Or are they genuinely pursuing the advancement of privacy in these systems? Really, if you go through and answer these questions, you're doing a lot more due diligence than the vast majority of people in this space. And this is something you absolutely should do, even if you're just investing, but especially if you're trying to rely on these systems for the sake of your privacy. And then one last component here just on fungibility. Fungibility is a really important but often overlooked uh, characteristic of money. It basically says my $20 bill is worth the same as your $20 bill, Jake. If we exchanged our $20 bills, that there would be no exchange in value there. We would both be the same, like no one would be better off in that transaction. However, if you have transparent funds, so people know what the history of these funds are, then it's, it creates the potential for some money to be worth more than others. So if, if I had funds that came from a, a previous nefarious purpose, and I tried to change my tainted $20 worth of Bitcoin for Jake's clean $20 worth of Bitcoin, then Jake would lose value because he now has money he can't spend in as many places. And I gain value because I have new funds that I can spend anywhere. Um, so this is a major problem where you essentially have different classes, different grades of fund. You have your like grade A Coinbase new money level funds that are traded at a premium and you have mid grade where they're standard and then you have junk grade where they have some undesirable history uh, connected to them. So it really creates a difficult market when one Bitcoin is worth a different uh, is worth more or less than another Bitcoin. It makes things really, really complicated. And frankly, there's a lot of regulatory pressure to make sure that you are checking for this information since you can check to see what the history is. To give a little bit of an example, suppose that I'm just sending Jake a normal transaction. Hey, hey, Jake, I want to buy something from you. I'm going to send you one Bitcoin, right? Here's your money. So the problem is when I'm sending you money, Jake, I want to make sure that I'm not accidentally affiliating myself uh, forever on a transparent system with someone who could be nefarious. So what do I need to do? Well, I need to audit you, see like what history of funds that you're using, like what are you doing with your money? And I also need to look at everyone you interact with to make sure that none of those people are nefarious. And if I feel comfortable with that, then I can send you funds. Likewise, since you're receiving funds from me, 
you want to make sure you are not receiving tainted or undervalued funds. You're not being cheated. So you need to audit me and every source of funds that I receive. So there's a huge burden here. And honestly, if, if we are just two individuals sending transactions, we probably don't have the overhead of these huge data collection companies that are able to look at the blockchain data and really make a lot of use out of it. So what are individuals going to do? Well, individuals are going to use payment processors to specifically audit the source of funds. So now we're back to basically stage one, where instead of using payment processors to exchange funds directly, they're used to audit funds that are sent across to reduce liability for the sender and recipient in these transactions. So you'll have Visa that basically says, hey, this one person is, and again, I don't know this, this is just my suspicion, is that you will have companies that say this person's funds are clear and we've done an investigation and say this person's good. And they'll do the same for the recipient and then they'll allow a transaction to occur. So right, and it's so it's so ironic. I mean, we you we all thought that cryptocurrency was basically going to be the new form of cash, and what we're discovering now with big data and analysis is oh no, it's it's back to the, the same old in a way, unless unless you do take some sort of other steps, and, and it and it really is important. I mean. In the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, I, uh, we've seen quite a few, you know, we're seeing deep platforming on YouTube. We're seeing um, Pay, PayPal and other companies saying we won't do business with such and such person because of their beliefs. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a problem. Yes, absolutely. So we're, we're sort of back to square one here. Um, and the problem is the people that get, the people that lose out are not the merchants. It's not going to be a large company that already uses a, a large scale payment processor system and can easily afford one of these. It's going to be individual users that are going to be required to use one of these systems in order to reduce their personal liability so that they do not accept funds that accidentally shut down their Coinbase account or whatever else it might be for a completely legitimate purpose. So uh people that generally don't a, that does get a, a question do you believe that national governments will start saying you may not accept monero if you are a merchant because we will not be able to do this tracking that we want to do i think there's a risk there i i don't think it's especially realized especially in countries like the united states and even europe so um We've seen some com countries like South Korea that try to take a more heavy hand in these regards, but the reality is it's, it's difficult to really prevent these transactions from occurring and like completely, tra like completely legal trans transactions are fine. People are able to accept cash, which is a private form of payment or at least reasonably private form of payment for anything right now. It's, it's legal tender. And um, a government could actually help with this liability issue with fungibility by simply saying, as a sender or recipient, you are not liable for any funds you receive. Mm. Sure, someone could still look at the previous history of funds. They could say, hey, I don't want to accept funds that was used, uh, or at least I don't want to accept funds because I know you donate to a political campaign I don't approve of or, or whatever it might be. But at least that would severely limit this practice. Instead, regulation is sort of pushing it the other way where they're encouraging this sort of practice because it can be done. Um, and it makes some sense from the perspective they want to reduce fraud, et cetera. But ultimately, the person who loses out in the situation is, are, is not the merchant. I mean, yes, technically they need to pay for a payment provider that ideally they would not have to. But the real losers are the individuals who cannot go through the effort of doing this burden alone and will be required to use one of these systems in order to reduce their own personal liability. So it's, it's, a, it's generally a big problem. I, I, I know that uh, it's a major concern that people have of governments making private cryptocurrencies more difficult to accept, but Gemini, for instance, uh, supports Zcash. They have plans to support their fully shielded transactions. Uh, they're fully compliant and registered in the United States. 
Kraken supports Monero Circle, the parent company that bought uh, uh, that bought Poloniex, which supports Monero, also directly supports Monero. These two companies are fully compliant with regulations in the United States. So there's, I think that it would be very difficult, and it would be unlikely for these companies to, or for the for governments to, at least on a large scale, reasonably try and prevent these. Uh, on ramps and off ramps from being closed. They can absolutely try and impact them in some way, but users uh, will ultimately have access to BISC, other decentralized exchanges to still acquire funds, but it definitely would be more difficult in those cases. Sure. So with that, that's what I'll, all I have. I, I think that fungibility is an often overlooked aspect of funds. If Bitcoin was, so cash is fungible, your 20 bucks is worth essentially the same as my 20 bucks, right? But if, as we move to Bitcoin, we're sort of relearning what a non-fungible system is like. And yeah. if it was widely used, I, I, I fear that we would really fall into many of these traps. And I think that in order for something to be used as a real commerce utility, it needs to have fungibility as, as, a, as a, an important aspect. Now, one thing I really want to say right before we're done is that fungibility is not provided by the best case scenario of privacy in your system, it's provided by the lowest common denominator of privacy in your system. If you are receiving Bitcoin, you still need to check if I sent it through a mixer or a specific wallet provider or whatever it might be before you accept it. Maybe you prefer to accept funds that have been tumbled first. Maybe you don't wanna deal with those funds because you're worried about them being nefarious. So instead, um, you can see that it's not fungible from that perspective because the merchant still needs to do some sort of investigation because they still could receive tainted funds. So you need to look at what is the lowest common denominator of privacy in the system, and that determines how fungible the system actually is. So that's pretty interesting. All right. Absolutely. So in summary, Privacy is really hard, security is really hard, and fungibility is really hard. I could speak about any of these individual technologies for hours going into the future. Of course, we don't have that time tonight. We're already essentially creeping into the time now. I know we're probably a little bit over, but just keep in mind when you're evaluating these privacy technologies, this is really hard and it will always be hard. So don't try and necessarily jump on the train of someone who claims that they've solved the problem because it's an impossible problem to solve. We just have to keep getting better. And if they don't have the evidence to support their claims, then you should not take them seriously. So with that, I just have some of my contact information on there, including the Magic Grants website if you would like to support educational grants and cryptocurrency. Here's my Twitter. I usually post a lot of stuff there. And I'm going to stop sharing my slides now so we can get to the other cool part of answering other questions. Nice, right. nice. You you keep 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 your final slide up for a little bit in case uh, you know somebody's copying down the um, info or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I want to make sure everybody please uh, write your questions. But let's uh, let's jump in. So. Um, uh, let's go straight to JR's question, and he asks, what do you think of all the parallel implementations of CryptoNote? Um, and I don't know what CryptoNote is, and so maybe you can tell us um, if you're familiar, such as Rio and BitTube. Does this in any way help in the constant battle for privacy and decentralization? Also, what is the extent of connection between decentralization, privacy, and Monero. I think you've talked about that second part, but um, yeah, uh, CryptoNote, Rio, BitTube. Perfect. So I'll speak for a second with the slide up and then I'll turn it off <laughs> just so you can see it again. But I admittedly have never heard of BitTube at all. So I have no opinion on it either way, but um, maybe I'll look into it after if they legitimately have some privacy advancement. Now, Rio, has been developed, uh, so we're, I guess, getting back to CryptoNote. CryptoNote is the name of the implementation that Monero uses. So whereas most cryptocurrencies are based off the Bitcoin protocol, Monero is based off the CryptoNote protocol. Now, CryptoNote has evolved quite a bit over the years. Monero is very different than Bitcoin, which is the original CryptoNote implementation. 
And when people talk about crypto no coins nowadays, they generally refer to forks of Monero because you don't want to fork the old stuff that's changed way too much. Uh, it's improved way too much. So like, uh, for instance, old crypto note code had the blockchain stored in RAM, for instance, rather than stored on an actual hard drive that is designed mm -hmm. for actually using relatively large blockchain sizes even. So that's what crypto note is. Now, Rio is at least a little bit interesting. It is. It was created by a disgruntled Monero contributor uh, who <laughs> who did not uh, who originally created a Monero form funding system request, but tried releasing code under a, a non permissive license that we could not merge into Monero. And as a result, there was a general fallout there. I, they, they've tried to make a few changes. Uh, most recently, they said that they're going to try and change their payment ID and other structures. Uh, generally, these are already well understood attacks that Monero has addressed and has chances to deprecate. I would just say generally be very suspicious of someone who tries a claim that something's sort of the end of the world and falling um, like they did with, with payment ID transactions, for instance. Uh, yes, they negatively impact privacy, but they do not really impact the privacy of the network as a whole, as the, the main developer of, of Rio claimed. And um, it's really hard to say what the actual, like it, it's generally not a, a major issue that we're really concerned about. And we already have a deprecation plan in place and we've had it in place for at least six months. So this mm -hmm. is a, a new thing that sort of came out of nowhere. Uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. We've had some forks in the past where they say like uh, like a, a new problem will be realized and they'll be like, well, we are fixing this problem. We're like, well, the, the solution's already been implemented or whatever else. So there's a lot of misunderstanding there. And um, I would say I, I have no investment in Rio. I don't think they've really differentiated themselves enough, uh, but they have one person that has at least shown that they know what the Monero code base is, which is itself sort of rare. Um, so some people have a positive opinion. I still think most people have a general negative opinion in that regard. And it is substantially smaller than the Monero community. So if you are genuinely sending private, private transactions there, I would say it, it should be far worse because you have a lot less entropy in the pool. Uh, very few people are sending Rio transactions and it's a lot harder to hide in that much smaller crowd. However, for a speculation, speculative toward of side of investment thing, I don't know, may, maybe. I, that's something you can look at, I guess. Um, and Suzanne, I, I do not know anything about BitTube. I have no idea. Um, generally, I'm not a fan though of, if what you described is what it is, um, I'm generally not a fan of people who build systems for the purpose of supporting a, a traditional centralized system. You can normally just use Monero or, or Bitcoin or whatever it might be or Zcash for the sake of that functionality. So I don't know, keep that in mind. Um, there are a few other Monero forks out there. There are a few other Zcash forks out there. I would say generally, since privacy is really, really hard generally, it's unlikely that everyone likes to use the term like, oh, it's, it's the same technology, but it's a much smaller market cap. It has room to grow is what people often say, or it has a lot of growth potential. What really has more growth potential? The existing project with thousands of contributors, with paid researchers and existing research on the effectiveness of the technology and people who are researching and developing new implementations or one person who forked a code over here? So it looks like, um, so I, I was just trying to, I haven't looked at, uh, I'm first time hearing about bit two, but it looks like so they write here, somebody writes, formerly we had D2 powered by Steemit, but now a bigger and better video publishing platform powered by blockchain is out to create an even fairer marketplace for the video content, BitTube, and it achieves its user incentivization goals via the IPFS, interplanetary file system. Um, some of you, we did a um, talk on that, and BitTube coin formerly known as IBPC. So I don't know if this is a competitor to D2 powered by Steemit or if this is something completely new. And I don't know 
Oh, okay. So, oh, okay. Somebody's writing in chat. D two left Steam at platform because reasons. The void must be filled. <laughs> okay. So, so does that mean D two is uh? doesn't exist anymore or is it just not part of steam it or has it morphed into bit two anyways uh just feel free to write in the chat i don't know what it has to do though with privacy coins um that's the one part that i'm not yeah i don't i current on close ins or initial inspection i don't see anything about privacy features um I, I I don't know. I don't I don't really think this is especially relevant to this conversation. I have yeah. never heard of this before, and generally I'm pessimistic about solutions that just try and recreate a centralized system on the blockchain just because you can. Um, let's oh yeah like yeah the, the concern I have too generally this isn't necessarily mean it's a scam, but it's generally at least a concern. They said that they have a fair distribution with no ICO or pre-mine, but they take a portion of the block reward. So that's just something to keep in mind is that they- Which, What are you talking about? They, like of the new coins that are issued, the company takes a certain- Are you, are you talking about Rio or which one? Uh, this BitTube coin thing. Oh, so BitTube. Oh, that's okay. something to keep in mind. They have, they have a referral program. These are generally red flags in terms of um, right again it, it's not necessarily a, a non-starter but it it lends itself to that so sure. I, I, I that's not a sort of project i would support um okay well i have a couple uh, quick up uh, questions for you um so uh what updates uh are coming down the pipeline in this privacy realm that we should be looking forward to and be very excited about and uh, yeah, so what excites you? So I, I'm really for anything that allows privacy to be more easily used. I, I really want the quality of privacy to be to increase, to be better understood, so we know how to connect the use to threat models a lot better. And I want it to be super, super easy. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, bulletproofs and sapling were huge in this regard. Absolutely enormous. It's hard to, like, you had, what, at least 80% improvement in Monero's performance and a substantial improvement in Zcash's sending performance. These are huge, and it's not something we can necessarily expect as a as a twice-a-year upgrade. Um, totally. Because that's, the, like, we've almost, like, uh, oversold what we can do at this point because they're so large. You need to remind people that like, eh, maybe next year we'll get like 10%. Um, so with, with Monero, we're always looking, we're, we're really concerned about these ring signatures. They help people in many circumstances, but we really want something that is better. Uh, whether it's using larger ring signatures that are more effective or using some sort of side chain solution where people can use other privacy solutions on top of uh, Monero's privacy solutions, or even moving to new trustless sort of systems too. Um, unfortunately, there isn't anything that's really production level yet, but they're all pretty interesting. And so the researchers are keeping an eye on all these things. And, um, and so uh, it, it's, there'll be continuous improvements here going forward. And uh, most of the benefits will be towards usability. Zcash. So, so, so one of the things you brought up was that even some people are sending money to themselves and that's sort of like a research direction. So that, that almost makes me think, do you think uh, that there, at some point the system is going to just evolve where it's just moving money automatically just to create um, activity, which is harder to track? That's a, Potential option. One second. Let me check on. Okay, so they claim it's still going. Um, so that's a potential option that people can do, but um, it's it's hard to say. Yeah, so we're still live. Sorry, it just froze for a second. My other player. Yeah. yeah. But, um, so that the problem though with that is you need your client to be online all the time, which is unrealistic. So. Gotcha. Uh, 
I would say it's unlikely. I, I think most likely you just have better solutions that people can put in their specific use cases and the wallet is better able to handle those. Uh, we have some indication on the approximate ring sizes and number of transactions for even extreme use cases you should be worried about. Um, like Monero is a tool and by default it provides a ton of protection. But if you are in North Korea, you're going to need more protection than someone in the U.S. Um, or, or if you're an attacker, you probably want to care more um, for better or worse, right? So uh, those are considerations. Really, it's it's a lot of difficult research, though, um, that, that's, that's been ongoing. But uh, the Monero research team, one of the researchers is specifically focused on these aspects. For Zcash, they released a sort of wish list going forward. They do not want to make transactions fully private to begin with. They say, uh, well, they're, current lack, they're currently lacking some functionality, including multi-sig in their fully shielded transactions, which would hurt usability. Uh, perhaps some of their exchanges need that feature. And, um, but, but they've tried to come up with improvements for different proof of work where you have some portions that are uh, that are GPU and CPU friendly, for instance, and uh, other tweaks, improvements to privacy. Short term, Zcash needs to essentially do two things for their privacy. They need to come up with the, the best sort of method for sending transactions uh, from Sprout to Sapling uh, in this mm -hmm. upgrade process. Uh, like I said, I, I have been essentially the only one so far that has put out any recommendation at all. Um, so we're really waiting on the Zcash team to really have any say here before they move forward in terms of helping people keep their funds at least partially private in this regard. So that, that's, a, that's a major, I assume that in several years time, there will be several research papers written on the amount of metadata that was leaked in this transit transition process, because it I didn't know you were even involved with Zcash, so that's interesting. Yeah, cool. I've, I've recently been helping them in those regards. You can uh, there's a specific GitHub, GitHub issue where I have a long dump of text um, with my recommendations, and they also have issues with the outputs, where they essentially used to do an output system that was better than Monero. And then they regressed to one that was worse than Monero, but they can change it to be the same or better than Monero. And uh, at the moment, you need to live with the worst implementation. And for future updates, they want to make it essentially equivalent. So you need to deal with that right now. Uh, those are updates that really will come with the next two. Gotcha. OK, um, final, final question for me. Um, if anybody else has anything, up, please do type it in on the chat. Um, do you see any new competitors that, I mean, I know it's always hard to predict this, but is is there going to be some new entrant that is going to come in and just wow the socks off of everybody? So I think the two closest big entrants as far as uh, what the technology is pointing towards, um, the, the big two developments are going to be like Grin, which uses the Mimble Wimble protocol. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. It is does not offer the same privacy advantages as Monero and Zcash do, at least in terms of what the best of what they do. But it is very efficient, and that might be enough for most people. So that might receive a lot of use because people might be like, yeah, I care about privacy, but I don't live in... I don't live in North Korea, so this is fine enough for me, or, or whatever they might be feeling. Or they're like, this is still better than using a credit card, so I'm going to use this. Uh, that, that's a totally legitimate, realistic argument. And so that... Yeah, um, although if, if, if Monero and Zcash get good enough, then you're sort of, you know, then you're like, well, why would I use something that's half big, half there, and not go all the way, right? I mean, yeah. So. And if, if Monero and Zcash continue to become far more efficient, it would definitely provide an argument for that. Um, but currently out of the box, this solution is already more efficient generally. And so there's a potential for it to provide, sort of fill a niche where there's a sensible amount of privacy that might be enough for many people, but more efficiency advantages. 
And then uh, the ZK Starks that I referred to with Starkware, mm -hmm. there is an opportunity for in the future as these become more efficient to provide similar really good levels of privacy that we have now with fewer trade-offs. And so that would be an absolute win in, this, in the, the real battle for privacy as we're going forward. So I think those are the two real projects to keep an eye on as, as we move uh, as we move forward. I know Grin and Beam, which both these Mimblewimble, are nearing close to release. So this is something that might receive uh, a lot of adoption going forward, uh, potentially at least. And um, they're both uh, at least sensible sort of things you can do with, with blockchain-based systems given their limitations. So yeah. those are my two recommendations there. Cool. Thanks, man. Um, all right. I think, uh, I think we're good. Um, thanks for all your time today. Absolutely. Thank you, Jake, for asking me to set this up. I, I think it was awesome. Hopefully it provides value. Yeah, uh, definitely. Everyone, and especially the Minnesota, uh, the blockchain to Minnesota meetup group. And, um, if anyone here is still listening, I have a, I have a, a similar talk planned for tomorrow at uh, <laughs> Minnesota Cryptocurrency uh, Group. So if you want to meet me in person, come tomorrow. But uh, I'm happy to speak with you. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to say before we sign off? No. Nice job. I'm, so you got a little practice before tomorrow, huh? Yes. <laughs> Did you just make this deck? Um, it's It's kind of... I, I've given a lot of talks, so it's it's sort of every version adapts a little bit. Because <laughs> because I saw in it you had ring signatures, and I think you had them at nine, but now you said that Monero's at eleven, right or thirteen? I can't remember. So yeah. I knew you probably made it a little bit ago. <laughs> yeah, they they have uh, they have some updates over time, and sometimes some some take more effort to update than others. <laughs> Fair enough, man. That's cool. I appreciate your time. It was, uh, it was very informative. I think people liked it. So that's cool. All right. So okay. what, what is, uh, what is the, uh, blockchain? What is this other group tomorrow? Yeah. So it is my student cryptocurrency club on campus. at the oh, University of Minnesota. Gotcha. We, uh, gotcha. we're open to everyone though. You can go to mncryptocurrency.org, um, in order to see what events we have and, Etc. So nice, nice. Twice a week. Jeez, dude! Wow, that's <laughs> intense. All right, sounds good. Have a great time. Good luck. Yep. Thanks, Jake. Take care. All right. Take care. See you.